DJ Del Dilla with the morning wake up workouts. 12 minutes now past the hour of 8 o'clock. Please welcome to our morning show microphones the Deputy Chief of the Minneapolis Police Department, the Chief of Staff. Say hello to Art Knight. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Glad to have you with us this morning, sir. Uh, thank you for having me uh, this morning, Mr. Bell. I'm going to have you lean in just to that microphone just a little bit more. I think that's going to be okay. Okay. So last night uh, was another busy night for the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, yes, it was. Uh, we had uh, uh, a shooting yesterday. A young uh, individual was shot. And we also had several reports about shots being fired, too. Wow. So what does your day as a deputy chief start out like? What's the first thing that hits your desk? How do you go through your day? Uh, every morning, uh, I look at my uh, emails about 5 a.m. in the morning, and I get a report. And the report states how many people were actually shot, how many people were actually murdered, and also how many incidents we had of shots being fired in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So this past weekend was one of the most deadly that I can remember in one weekend with four people losing their lives, over six people shot, or ten people shot in the past weekend. Uh, what does that do to the crime statistics when you look year over year with homicides and violent crime in the Twin Cities? I mean, when you look at uh, violent crime in the Twin Cities, actually we're down about 20% this year. Mm -hmm. But when you look at all the numbers, how many homicides, how many people we have shot this year, like we have uh, about approximately about 24 homicides so far uh, this year. Mm -hmm. We have about 180 people who are actually shot uh, this year. And every day we have about 15, 20 shots fired activation. So you add that up at the year, we have uh, thousands of uh, shots being fired throughout the city. So when you look at it, the, the numbers uh, don't include this past weekend. So it appears as if we're doing better this year. But you know, when you have 20, 28 homicides versus 29 homicides, uh, there's a percentage difference, but then the number of lives that are taken, the number of families that are impacted, it still has a really negative impact on our on our community. Uh, yes, it does, because even uh, yesterday, uh, I attended a crime and safety meeting at Hawthorne neighborhood, because uh, one of the uh, last events we had uh, on 26th and Emerson, uh, we had uh, two individuals who were actually uh, shot and killed. And we also had a young lady, too, who was actually injured by a gunfire. So we talked with the residents of Hawthorne neighborhood and their concerns were they don't feel safe in their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And they talk about every day when they go to bed, they hear shots being fired and the resources they want to uh, try to help prevent this. So what, uh, what can we do as community? I do know that uh, uh, there was just a report just this morning uh, where the owner of a brewery was talking about he just, he's just tired an hour after the, the place closed that there was a homicide in his parking lot. He says he just doesn't feel safe, his employees doesn't, don't feel safe, that they're going to move their businesses out. What can we as, uh, number one, I guess it's three, threefold. What can we do as a community? What can the police department do? And what can our politicians do? You know, I'm glad you said that. It should be a three-prong uh, attack for this. We should have police, community, and elected officials working together. Mm -hmm. And we have to acknowledge that we have a gun violence problem in Minneapolis. And again, thoughts and prayers goes out to all the young men and families who've lost their loved ones to gun violence. But again, we have to have community and police working together. And so many times we have instances where we might have a, just say officer involved shooting. And then right now, people blame the police for doing violence or being in the community. But again, also with law enforcement, when we look at all the violence that's happening and the resources we want to put in the communities to make them safe. And uh, Freddie, I tell everyone this, every community in Minneapolis, the majority of people are great people. Mm -hmm. They want a safe place to raise their family, raise their kids. And it's just a small percentage, three to six percent, who commit a violent act. And when you look at also with the police department, the majority of police officers who go out there every day are great individuals who want to serve and protect the citizens. But we have to acknowledge that we have violence out there and we have to do something about it. And again, local uh, officials too uh, have to acknowledge what resources are we going to put to solve these problems. And I tell people, we can't police ourselves all of these problems. Now every uh, inspector, every precinct, I wish I could have had more staff to give them. Mm -hmm. But we uh, deal with what the resources we have. But again, when you look at the main issue, it has a lot to do with poverty, has a lot to do with uh, employment opportunities, jobs, and housing. And I found out, I've been on the department 27 years, until individuals have a way out of poverty, 
you give them jobs, you give them housing, you're going to have a disproportion of those individuals where we have homicides, where we have shootings. So I would say to my elected officials, we really have to solve those issues. If not, the police will be brought in to do a Band-Aid fit, fix, fix to it. So you can't police your way out of this. I, I hear you saying uh, I, you can put, you could double the staff, and I, I think I hear you saying that that's not going to solve the issue either. You know, I would, uh, I would like to say it's uh, a short-term fix and also a long-term fix because right now, the community meeting I was at last night, the short-term fix is we do need more police. Okay. We do need more, more of a police presence when you have individuals out there committing crimes, homicides, shooting people. But what I say the systemic long-term effects is we have to do some about poverty. We have to do some about jobs. We have to do some about the disproportionate number of African American males, Native American males, Hispanic males who get caught up in the system and being arrested. Because if we don't do anything about that, but when I say long term, that's been that didn't just happen overnight. Correct. That's been generation after generation. So it's not gonna be fixed overnight. So when we talk about systemic issues we have in society with dealing with poverty, we that's gonna be a long term uh, fix. But there's a short-term fix right now is people need to feel safe, and that's why we have to put more uh, resources into law enforcement. And I say good policing. We need good policing efforts out there, being respectful, helping people. So how do you help the community when it happens down the block? We, we saw the kids who were doing the shooting. We saw the young people who were doing the shooting, the old people who were doing the shooting. But I don't want to turn them in because I don't want the retaliation that happens as a result of putting the finger on someone. And again, um, when you look at the homicides in the city, and nationally, only 60% of homicides are actually solved. So, uh, Freddie, when you look at that number, out of every 100 homicides we have nationally, 40 of them go unsolved. And when you look at cities like Chicago and New, and New Orleans, New Orleans only has a 24% solvency rate. Mm -hmm. So uh, every 100 homicides that happen in New Orleans, 76 don't get solved. And I tell people, do you want to have a better community? And we have to stand up as a community and say, you know what, we're not going to tolerate this violence anymore. And we have to come forward. Because guess what, this time it, it might have been uh, your neighbor. The next time it could be one of your family members, somebody you love. Mm -hmm. And how would you feel if you had a family member whose life was taken away from violence and no one said anything about it? That's a tough one. Yeah. At, at the outside of our conversation, I thought you said something was interesting as bears re repeating before we have to go to break, that your day starts out early, you look at the report, and you send out the reports. When there's an officer involved shooting, your phone rings off the hook. When it's one community member against the other community member, nothing happens. Right. Th that's a point I was making. And what I want, want to say is I have no problem when the community holds us accountable when we have an officer involved shooting. But hold us just as accountable, and let's hold the community accountable too. Like uh, we, this weekend we have four people shot. And again, if we have elected officials who contact us and say, uh, I have an issue uh, with the way you handled this officer while shooting, call us about, say you have that same sincere approach to the young men who are dying here in Minneapolis. And I want to see that. Again, I do want to thank Council Member Ellison last night for attending the Hawthorne meeting. He attended the Hawthorne meeting last night. But again, every council member, you're not just a council member for your ward, you're a council member for the whole entire city. So whenever we see a life taken, I'm a, I, ho I would hope my phone would ring off the hook for all 13 council members. Mm -hmm. And it's sad, but currently that's not being done right now. Uh, real quickly, uh, just going to a different community where we have Native Americans living in encampment, 300 people uh, living there now is growing, health concerns. Uh, what is the police department doing about that? Well, the police department uh, and the mayor's office, we're working together, and we're trying to uh, get social services out there because the people in the, that encampment, a lot of them suffer from uh, mental, uh, mental uh, health issues. A lot of them uh, su suffer from opioid addiction, heroin overdoses. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to put resources in there to actually get them help, get them actually a place where they can actually have a decent place to live. But again, you look at the capacity that the city has. What capacity does the city has to fight homelessness? And we're talking about this issue right here just with our Native American community. We also have this issue right here with our Latino community, our African American community. So, I mean, homelessness and, uh, and this poverty is a, uh, is a big issue, but again, 
uh, what you're saying specifically to that encampment there, we have a uh, health department coming out there looking, seeing what resources we can provide. But it's a, it's a major issue. Look with me in my crystal ball. What would happen if the, the Fortune 500 companies would uh, swoop into a community, they have clipboards and they just walk down the street and they do an Oprah. You got a job, you got a job, you got a job. Are you looking for work? I've got you. How would that change as you look into your crystal ball? How would that change our communities? You know, um, I think the majority of people they would love to have an opportunity to have employment, have a house over their head. And I mean, I think it would be great. Chief Arredondo has started a lot of initiatives within the Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, he has actually went out to Fairboard Prison. He actually talked to young men at Fairboard Prison. He asked them, what's your number one concern? And they told Chief Arredondo, uh, sir, when we get out of prison, we need a place to stay. Mm -hmm. We need a roof over our head. And he flat out said, if we don't have a roof over our head, you know, it's, it's gonna be tough. And so I would say you have to give people basic, I mean, we're talking about basic necessities, and that's what you're saying right mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. giving people a job, giving people a house. And those are basic things that a lot of people don't have. So, I mean, whether it's Fortune 500 companies, whether it's our elected officials working to put resources there, I wish it was some way to do it. Public and private seem to work well together when they can decide that they can do it <laughs> yeah. Yeah. in our communities. Mm -hmm. Art Knight, I can't thank you enough for being with us. Our Deputy Chief for Minneapolis uh, Police Department, uh, Chief of Staff, and uh, we will offer an opportunity. We'll talk off air about that, but I think we need to keep our community informed about what is going on uh, with, in terms of how we are protecting each other and lifting each other up in our communities. Thank you, sir. Uh, thanks for having me.